tick tock, tick tock. I cry a tear for all the children born in the age of the electric clock. <laughs> uh, John, come help me in the kitchen and put some more coal on the fire. My mother's words are still with me, reminding me of what I need to do, whether it's combing my hair, washing my hands, or putting more coal on the fire. Auntie Annie and Uncle Will are going to be here any minute, and I don't want them saying anything about needing a cardigan to stay warm. We always have relatives over for dinner at Christmas, and Christmas 1953 is a very special occasion. This year, it's Auntie Annie and Uncle Will, who are as Welsh as anyone can possibly be. <laughs> and my Uncle George, weather-worn, old as the hills, and my favorite person in the world. And Tom, stop filling with that clock. Well, it's three o'clock, you heard Big Ben and the wireless. I've got to adjust the weights, or we'll be behind time for the rest of Christmas Day. <laughs> There, now it's done. We won't lose another minute till Boxing Day. My childhood is filled with the winding of clocks, the chiming of Big Ben on the wireless, and the little bends in all the front parlors of my relatives. A Welsh mantra, a mystical chant, the pacing of life at a verifiable rhythm. You can hurry up or slow down, but there's always the beat of the clock bringing you back to center, to home. There it was, still on the wall. The front parlor was gone. The whole bloody house was gone. But the clock was still there. Not even the glass was broken. This wall-mounted pendulum beauty with Big Ben chimes is not an heirloom handed down from father to son, but rather the only surviving life form in a bombed house across the street from the house where I was born. Edie, I want that clock on the ship with us. I am serious about this. Well, then you'd better do a prop job of packing it. <laughs> right then. There's some cardboard in my van at the station. We can start right after Boxing Day. That clock is your responsibility, John. It's not going in the trucks. We'll build a special box and you will carry it to New York. Helping my father build the cardboard box, cradling the precious cargo that I will carry by a roped handle onto the Queen Elizabeth becomes a test of manhood. <laughs> Necessary preparation, it seems for a journey to a place where I will be living with cowboys, gangsters, <laughs> and Doris Day. <laughs> I have always been in love with Doris Day. She'll never compare to Ginger Rogers and Jeanette MacDonald. <laughs> My father's vision of American beauty is firmly fixed in the 1930s. Everything of value, it seems, happened before the war. All the little bends in all the houses of my relatives seems to, to chime the lament. Before the war, tick-tock. Before the war, tick-tock. But the war brought the Americans. <laughs> and nothing has ever been the same again. Mm. The world is changing, boy. But your dreams still belong to you. So have a good look at Swansea while you still can. This will always be your home. Sometimes when I dream, I am still almost 12 years old. An awkward Welsh boy sitting by my parlor window, smelling the sea and the Christmas pudding as I listen to American Armed Forces Radio on the short wave and dream of America. Jack Benny. Father knows best, Burns and Allen. For brief moments, I am already there as I watch the ships on the River Towie, 
Some heading to the north dock of Swansea, while others head out to sea. Maybe to New York. Merry Christmas, George, early as usual, I see. <laughs> it's your cooking, Edie. I can smell the mince pies from my house. Well, John, where are the new annuals? We better have a read before Will gets here, or he'll hide them away and give you a copy of the New Testament. You just let the boy read for himself. It's Christmas, Edie. Time to have some fun. You are 76, not 12 years old. <laughs> well, that depends on who I'm talking to. Uh, could I please have just one of those mince pies before dinner? <laughs> only one, and only one story. Well then, uh, I'll have mince pie now and save the story for later, after Will finishes pouring fire and brimstone in the boy's ear. Now don't you start teasing Will when you get here, and I want you on your best behavior, or our guests will think the Welsh are all ignoramuses. <laughs> I'm not special enough anymore. <laughs> Don't tell me you've invited an Englishman. <laughs> she invited Cousin Freddy and his new wife Frances that he met in the service, and that was just the start. Unnatural, that's what it is. <laughs> a Welshman marrying a German. <laughs> you've gone too far this time, Edie, inviting Frances, her, her sister's husband, and their son. Your brother Will was right. Once a German, always a German. <laughs> you just worry about keeping this place in order for the day, Mr. Tidy Tom. Family, food on the table, and coal on the fire. That's how I want to remember Swansea when I look back from America. I want to make this the best Christmas ever. Are you sure you don't want to invite the Pope? Careful what you say, Tom. You'll be living with Italian Catholics soon <laughs> enough. <laughs> well, at least George understands that the world is bigger than Swansea, and thank you, George, for your contribution from your ration card. You will be pleased to know that through some <coughs> elaborate negotiation, I have managed to acquire two chickens for Christmas dinner. Ha <laughs> ha! You've outdone yourself, Edie. There's even real <coughs> butter, custard slices, mince pies, Welsh cakes, and unless my eyes deceive me, Gable's already cider. I think I doubt it went to heaven. <coughs> you just make sure you don't take more than your share, and that cider is for after dinner. Well, we can still have our annual Christmas Guinness, George, with nutmeg and sugar. <coughs> nutmeg and sugar are added, before their tumblers are ritually stabbed with steaming red-hot pokers from the fire. <laughs> That's a Christmas way to do it, but uh, I shudder as the dark richness of liquid foam is pierced by glowing heat, for with one quick jab, my childhood seems to vanish. John? You look like you saw old Marley's ghost. Uh -huh. Don't go worrying, boy. If someone tears down your sandcastles, you can always build another. Never mind sandcastles, George. He's too much of a dreamer already. And come away from that window, John. If you spent more time looking at books instead of ships, you'd have passed your 11 plus. <laughs> My parents are caretakers for Burroughs Chambers an office building right on the Swansea docks. Uh, we live on the top floor, above the offices. And from five o'clock, when the workers leave, we clean the rooms and prepare 16 coal fires for the next morning. My job is to empty the ashtrays and waste paper baskets, while my father offers profound advice. Always do the job right, John, but remember to polish the brass doorknobs. Shiny knobs, though they ever notice anyway. <laughs> what my father does not know is that I have discovered the uh, girly magazines that Mr. Owens keeps under some folders in his bottom desk drawer. 
You're taking a long time at that office, John. <laughs> this discovery has revealed a whole new world inhabited by the likes of women that I have never seen. John, if you're just going to sit there behind that desk with your hands in your front trouser pockets, you might as well go upstairs and finish your homework right now. <laughs> Visions of familiar feminine faces attached to me scantily dressed bodies fill my head as I leave that particular office with the cleanest asteroids and the shiniest doorknobs in the entire building. <laughs> <clears throat> Although I'm sure that Mr. Owens will appreciate the excellent job you've done, you have raised the standard. Everyone in the building will expect their offices to be just as spick and span as this one. Consistency, John. That's the thing to remember, and you will always survive. I keep this in mind as I find other reasons to linger near that desk drawer after my work is finished. Well, what's the matter, boy? Don't you want to roller skate tonight? <laughs> Reluctantly, I return to the hallways that belong to me when my work is done. For when the offices are closed, these drab, empty corridors are transformed into the greatest roller skating rink in the entire world. Now, now don't go skating in that entrance hall. Your mother just finished scrubbing that floor. But there are no such rules on Christmas Day when my new German cousin joins me in a roller skating chase up and down the echoing halls where marble floors make metal wheels sound like rolling thunder. Finally, Uncle George comes down the steps and sits at the bottom holding my new Eagle Christmas Annual with stories about spacemen. All right, boys, put those skates away. It's time for Dan Dare. <coughs> On holidays, Uncle George always reads tales of adventure his lilting old Welsh voice rising and falling with the victories and defeats of the heroes leaves you still and silent. We sit, roller skates hushed, to hear the latest adventures of Dan Dare, pilot of the future as he faces the villains from outer space. Dan aimed his ray gun at the advancing trains. You'll never take control of my ship. The smell of pipe tobacco in my uncle's coat pocket is comforting. Everything about him is comforting. <clears throat> if I still believed in Father Christmas, he probably would look like Uncle George. Dan's spaceship shot into outer space in hot pursuit of the trains in their flying saucer. His little row house is very close to Oxford Street School, where I learned the uh, <coughs> important lessons in life, such as how to pee slightly upward and downwind to win the distance contest in the schoolyard lavatory. <laughs> <laughs> Every school day, I'd rush to join him for lunch. The smell of spam, Frying, the bubbling squeak envelops me as the front door opens. Put out the plates, do the bread, and watch Sammy doesn't drink the milk for the tea. Sammy, his cat, <laughs> plays as I toast bread on the fire. Then we eat and talk about his army days in the Boer War, always referring to the wonderful photographs of soldiers on the mantelpiece, all lined up facing the camera. Uncle George was an army cook who hated the offices and laughs every time he tells me how they spit in the stew pot before serving. It adds flavor. I listen as I have never heard him say this, these words before, and every day I laugh. John will help your mother set the table. For Christmas dinner, there is the best lace tablecloth best dishes and the sideboard festooned with bright streamers and proudly displaying 
Christmas cake, try for mince pies and Welsh cakes. It looks lovely, Edie. You made it look like one of those colour pictures in a magazine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Auntie Annie's voice has the quality of a high-pitched Welsh foghorn. <laughs> <laughs> All Tom noticed is that bottle of cider. He's been eyeing it since this morning. Not a drop, I told him. Not a drop until after dinner. Quite right, Edie. You know what men are like once they start? So, you're going to be a yank, are you? You'll be wearing long trousers and shirts with pictures on them. Careful you don't forget where you come from. Uncle Will. The deacon of his chapel in Gore Sinai speaks slowly with the assurance that God is on his side. <laughs> He's a roly-poly man with braces and always a shirt and tie. A man is undressed without a shirt and tie. <laughs> I do not like Sundays at Uncle Will's house. <laughs> No wireless is allowed. No newspapers, books, or music. Only the Bible. Mm -hmm. The Sabbath belongs to Jesus and to chapel. <laughs> chapel or not. He does not seem to mind these distractions at our house on Sundays or Christmas. Uncle Will sits quietly near the wireless in the front parlor, reading the same page for half an hour while educating Archie is on the BBC. A slight grin curves the edges of his mouth when Harry Seeker makes jokes or Julie Andrews sings. And Auntie Annie's voice trails in from the kitchen riding the aromas of roast chicken and Brussels sprouts. Give me the pan dripping easy and make a lovely gravy. You can, you can hear her voice if you are down the street and all the windows are shut tight. <laughs> nothing, nothing is more embarrassing than walking along the street with some boys as a piercing trumpet of Auntie Annie's Welshy voice lassoes you like Hopalong Cassidy chasing down a desperado. Is that you, John? Don't you look smart in your uniform? Tell your mother I'll be over after shopping and not to worry about tea. I'll be catching the bus for Kingsbridge at four. Even as the other boys laugh, they can all hear a relative of their own from Merthyr Tidville or some other coal mining town in the valley. Now, Edie, make sure you don't put that bread pudding in front of Will after dinner. Just give him one helping, that's all he needs, or I'll be widening his trousers tomorrow. <laughs> Her voice and the aroma of roast chicken makes my father look up from his newspaper, rolling his eyes as he looks towards the kitchen with expressions that tell far more than words. John, put one of those Paul Robeson records on the Victrola and make sure it's loud enough so we don't hear Annie. <laughs> <laughs> the moment that scratchy 78 bellows forth Paul Robeson's voice, my father declares, there's a singer for you. His collection of 78s, mostly American is an escape from reality we both share. Paul Robeson is his favorite, and for duets, nothing compares to Nelson Eddy and Jeanette <coughs> MacDonald. <laughs> Voices of the gods! The other thing we share is the LMS railway van, which he drives for a living. After school, I rush to Victoria Station and await his arrival with parcels for the train. I help him unload, fill the van with new, with new ones, and then off we go. <clears throat> Mind those parcels and carefully don't fall out the back. Sitting in the rear of the van, I have a grand view of the busy streets, the row houses, the factories, and always the sea. The sea makes Swansea a place of magic 
for it is always there, green or grey, and flat as my mother's Welsh cakes. While the town rises and falls and rises again, its arms reaching out, cupping as much of the sea as it can into a large basin. Hold tight, John, well up Constitution Hill. <laughs> The bumpy cobblestone drive up the steepest road in Swansea lets me see the world entering through those open arms, <clears throat> bringing dreams of America, Africa, and the Royal Navy. <clears throat> Already a sea scout, I see myself standing on the deck of a destroyer, heading out into the Bristol Channel and the Atlantic beyond. Never forget where you come from, John. A knot ties my stomach, ever tighter. As I glance downward at the docks, the bay, the lighthouse, and the clock tower of the civic center. Soon, my town will disappear, replaced by cowboys and gangsters. <laughs> Won't be long now, boy. We'll be on one of those ships. I think of Doris Day and all the Hollywood musicals watched from the front row of the Rialto Theatre, where mesmerized schoolboys sit for only threepence, with necks bent back as though looking at the sky, while chorus lines of long-legged girls dance across the screen, and we all dream of America. We're ready. There's plenty of room now that we brought the extra tables and chairs up from down the offices. We'll put them back as soon as we finish, and no one will know the difference. Borrowing furniture without permission is a very dangerous thing, Edie. <laughs> Once you start... Yeah, yeah, I made bread pudding, especially for you, Will, <laughs> with big sultanas. Yes, uh, well then, uh, thank you for the lovely <coughs> me. Bing Crosby is singing a white Christmas for the hundredth time as we sit at the table to hear Uncle George propose a toast. <coughs> Here's to the American adventure yet to come. There's no shame in changing your mind, Dee Dee. <laughs> Let them be any. It's their decision. Even if they haven't thought through the consequences. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they'll be meeting us at the dock with four cars. That's enough room to put all the trunks. One of those American cars is as big as my van. There'll be Italian Catholics driving every one of those cars. <laughs> Well, the Romans were in Wales before the English. Your ancestors are probably from Sicily. A whisper drifts voiceless, weaving through the plates and glasses, rising up, exploding in silence, falling gently, repeating rhythmically like my father's clock. We'll miss you. We'll miss you. Tick-tock. Tick-tock. Conversation continues while, out my window, the early darkness of Christmas dissolves the river and lights float in an effortless parade to and from the North Dock. Annie can help me wash the dishes while you take those tables and chairs back downstairs, Tom. And George will leave some of those mince pies for other people. It seems like Sunday evening, but there are no hand-rolled leftover woodbines tonight. Only the best players' cigarettes. Oh, those players make a lovely smoke, Tom. A shame you don't smoke, Will. You don't know what you're missing. <laughs> On Sunday nights, my father ritually hands me the Cadbury's biscuit tin, in which he saves the precious remains of his woodbines, smoked down so far they turn his fingertips yellow. <laughs> Now, now, careful with that razor blade, John. Cut the bird chips away, but don't waste any. I want every bit of that tobacco. There's enough there for 20 fags. <clears throat> the remains of tobacco from all butts. 
are made into new cigarettes in his little rolling machine. But not tonight. Tonight, everything is different. No one talks about the war. No one mentions rationing, politics, or the Queen. <laughs> we are going to America. And that is what matters. You'll be home in a year. It's dog eat dog. No place for a Welshman. Jealous. That's what you are. If they've got the nerve to go, then I wish them all the best. If I was younger, I'd be on the boat with them. That's where the future is. Who wants tea? Everyone responds to my mother's call as arguments rise and fall in traditional Welsh fashion over a hot cup, that second piece of Christmas cake, and whatever can be managed within the limits of slowly tightening buttons. <clears throat> that was the best bread pudding I could remember. It's the Sultanas, George. That's what makes the difference. We each find our way through the night with great anticipation of what is to come. My mother's solution, as usual, is to be as busy as she possibly can be. My father avoids company, reads the paper and smokes. At least the offices are closed tomorrow for Boxing Day. I'm not getting up till after twelve. And I have my lovely window where drawn curtains keep out the night. But I am enveloped by the darkness, with my back to the curtain and my nose to the glass, as I dream of cowboys, gangsters, and Doris Day. <laughs> Take it all in, boy. Remember the river. Remember the lights on Kilvey Hill. Uncle George arisen from his dream, joins me in mine. Swansea will always be with you. Together, we stare into the darkness. His thoughts in the past, mine in the future, meeting at the center as the pendulum swings. Tick-tock, tick-tock. Christmas, in Swansea is saying goodbye.